Over the past three videos, we have established how chemically and mineralogically similar the Apollo samples are to terrestrial basalts and HED meteorites. So similar, in fact, that some HED meteorites have been mistaken for lunar meteorites and vice versa. This leads us to the conviction that Apollo samples are a combination of terrestrial basalts and HED meteorites. Propagandists such as Jay Windley have claimed that Apollo samples can't be meteorites because you would need to chip away the outer burnt layer or fusion crust, the outer surface that was exposed to the intense friction and heat as the meteorite burned up through the atmosphere. Windley claimed that removing this layer would remove the high concentrations of helium-3 that has been found in the Apollo samples. Windley wrote, There are other surface features particular to moon rocks. The outer layer is rich in helium-3, an isotope difficult and expensive to acquire on Earth. It also shows interaction with the solar wind, which contains exotic elements not found on Earth. If the outer layer of the meteorite is chipped off to remove the evidence of passage through Earth's atmosphere, all the rich evidence of presence on the lunar surface is lost too. I responded along these lines by pointing out that helium-3 can also be found inside the rock, not just on the outside. And thus removing the outer layer won't remove anything. Webb responded along these lines. First of all, it is not only the outer layer that contains helium-3, it's the inside too. Nine years after Apollo 17 returned to Earth, scientists discovered the moon rocks the astronauts collected contained something far more valuable than gold. Inside them was a substance called helium-3. Jerem misses the fact that the moon rocks themselves contain relatively little helium-3 compared to the lunar regolith. The weak bonded helium-3 in moon rocks is produced by radiation from occasional solar flares that permeates the top few centimeters, and from cosmic rays that penetrate up to 3 to 5 meters into the rocks. The high concentration of strong bonded helium-3 in the lunar regolith is produced by the persistent solar wind ions that attain much shallower penetration. The one thing that Webb fails to mention is just how deep we would need to chip away at the rock. A quick look reveals... Fusion crust is very thin, usually less than one millimeter thick. It is generally the thickness of a heavy piece of paper. So to hide evidence of passage through the Earth's atmosphere, all NASA would need do is chip away at least one millimeter of the meteorite. Once the fusion crust is gone, you'd have a relatively undamaged specimen. And judging by that diagram that Webb shows, there would still be plenty of helium-3 inside the rock to spare. And I'd hate to contradict Phil Webb, but the solar wind penetrates much further than one micrometer. Webb knows that. If we look through his bibliography, we find an article on Eucrite DAG-872. Hmm, where have I heard that name before? In this article, we are told, the solar wind penetrates only a few millimetres in the soil. A few is more than one. Clearly, even if you chip away only one millimetre of the meteorite, there would still be plenty of solar wind-induced helium-3 to spare. Because helium-3 can be found inside the rock, as well as on the outside, chipping away the outer surface wouldn't lose anything. It's the same case with traces of cosmic radiation. Cosmic rays would be found on the inside as well as on the outside because they can penetrate several meters of material. This is like saying you can turn a cat into a dog if you put the right ears on him. It's no more than a bare assertion fallacy. Correction. It would be like saying you can turn a cat into a dog if you put the right ears on if, underneath the surface, the two were nothing alike. Webb again begins to ramble on and on about how regular meteorites have a different chemistry, mineralogy, and oxygen isotope ratio to the Apollo samples. He totally ignores the fact that the mineralogy, chemical composition, and oxygen isotope ratios of meteorites are different than the moon rocks, and chipping away the fusion crust doesn't magically make them the same. He is again comparing apples to oranges by focusing only on chondrites, 
not eucrites, howardites, and tecatites, which we know do closely match in chemical compositions to the Apollo samples. And he totally ignores how non-lunar meteorites, like eucrite DAG-872, can have the same oxygen isotope ratios as Apollo samples. Further, I never claimed that regular meteorites alone were used to fake NASA's lunar materials. I specifically said that the Apollo samples were a hybrid of meteorites and Earth materials. We've already shown, using Webb's own resources, how the Apollo 11 samples have virtually the same major element weight percentages as Orbitec's Earth basalt-derived lunar regolith simulants. We also saw how similar in composition they are to Eucrites and Howardites. The only thing these samples show, which you can't get on Earth, but can get from meteorites, is radiation. Simple solution, combine the two. Of course, you would need to remove the fusion crust. Underneath the fusion crust, the rock is relatively undamaged. And Webb's response? Sculptors, for instance, use calcite rocks like marble because they are relatively soft and they don't split along crystal planes like the harder minerals found in moon rocks, feldspar being a good example. The ceramist, whom Jira refers to, would obviously leave tool marks in the rocks. Sculptors sometimes refer to these marks as bruised stone, and they are caused by burrs or imperfections on the hardened tool that cut grooves or scratches into the newly exposed rock surface. These marks are easily visible under low power magnification, and it would be almost impossible for the tool not to leave traces of itself behind on the rock in the form of metallic dust, flakes, and fragments. Such trace evidence would stand out like a sore thumb even to a non-geologist. Earlier in his video on moon rocks in Antarctica, Webb shows us this photo of meteorite Allen Hills 81005. See this brownish outer layer? That's the fusion crust. See this darker section with white clasts? That's what it looks like after the fusion crust has been chipped away. That looks nothing like what is claimed by Webb. He also shows us this photo of Yamato 791197, also with its fusion crust mostly absent. Again, I am hard pressed to see any similarities between that and the bruised stone that Webb shows. As for the sculpture tools, leaving traces of themselves in the rock, these are the tools that NASA typically uses to prepare moon rock samples before sending them off to researchers. See any similarities? Traces of such tools would most likely appear in the samples that geologists analyze in any case. NASA usually sends out tiny 10 mg sugar cube sized pieces of moon rock that they simply chipped off from a larger specimen. And it's not just Apollo samples that undergo this treatment. Here's a video showing a Mars meteorite undergoing the same preparation. The NASA geologist uses a hammer and chisel to chip free a smaller subsample for analysis. Obviously, there would be traces of tool marks in these 10 milligram samples that NASA supplies regardless of whether they got there by chipping off the fusion crust or by chipping the 10 milligram subsample off in the first place. Webb's hype over traces of the tools and their markings found in the rock is clearly an attempt to sidestep the issue. A red herring, if you will. Jera also overlooks the fact that removing the fusion crust would subsequently remove a large portion of the helium-3, which occurs in the highest concentration near the outer surface of the meteorites. Webb's basis for this is his claim that the solar wind penetrates only as deep as one micrometer into the rock. Clearly, this is not the case. As demonstrated by his own source, the one where he nicked the DAG-872 oxygen isotope chart from, solar wind particles penetrate a few millimetres. And given that a fusion crust is typically less than a millimetre thick, there would still be plenty of solar wind-induced helium-3 left over. Even if a significant portion of helium-3 was lost in the process, it could easily be reapplied with the amount of helium-3 that can be obtained on Earth either from the 15 tons of natural deposits occurring on Earth, which greatly exceeds the total amount of lunar samples supposedly brought back from Earth, or developed artificially from nuclear materials. Curiously, 
Although Webb skims over the clip in which I mention that there is plenty of terrestrial helium-3 to apply to NASA's samples, he doesn't dispute that, but instead goes on to accuse me of fallacy of omission. Again, chipping away the outer surface will not remove evidence of cosmic rays found inside the meteorite. Second, if NASA wanted to lace their fake moon rocks with helium-3, they could have obtained this isotope from nuclear materials. As Wikipedia tells us, Due to the rarity of helium-3 on Earth, it is typically manufactured instead of recovered from natural deposits. Further, although natural helium-3 is extremely rare on Earth, it is not as scarce as the propagands make it out to be. As Ouyang Xiang, the head of China's moon program, once said, There are altogether 15 tons of helium-3 on Earth, while on the moon, the total amount of helium-3 can reach 1 to 5 million tons. In total, the Apollo astronauts allegedly brought back 382 kilograms of rock. 15 tons of helium-3 would be more than enough to apply to NASA's fake moon rocks. First off, helium-3 is not the only solar isotope found in moon rocks. The isotopes Neon-21 and Argon-38 are two other solar isotopes that are used to calculate the cosmic ray exposure age of moon rocks. And there are several other isotopes and isotope ratios that can be used to authenticate the origin of moon rocks. Ignoring these other characteristic isotopes found in lunar samples is a fallacy of omission. I ignored nothing. My entire segment on Helium-3 was made in response to a passage on Jay Windley's Moon Rocks page. He wrote a whole paragraph on the presence of Helium-3 in Apollo samples and used it as so-called proof. That's what I responded to. Windley didn't mention Neon-21 or Argon-38. Had he done so, I would have addressed these too. But since Webb has mentioned these two isotopes... <sighs> do I really need to tell you that the Neon and Argon isotopes that Webb mentions are also both present in regular meteorites? How else do you think geologists determine the exposure ages of these rocks? Secondly, the amount of helium-3 on Earth has nothing to do with the helium-3 found in moon rocks and lunar regolith. This is a red herring fallacy. Apparently someone has data showing that there's only 15 tons of helium-3 on Earth. That number is quoted in many places, including this Daily Galaxy article. I've seen estimates much higher than this in other places, but who cares? It's not a red herring, it's staying on topic. You wouldn't understand. Windley and other propagandists claimed that there was not enough helium-3 on Earth and thus not enough to apply to NASA's fake moon rocks. So, how much helium-3 would you need? According to this paper, the estimation of helium-3 probable reserves in lunar regolith by Sayuta, Abdrakimov and Galimov, helium-3 ranges from 1.4 to 15.1 parts per billion in lunar regolith. We'll take the upper estimation of 15.1 and apply that to all sample types. For 382 kilograms of Apollo samples, that comes down to 5.77 by 10 to the minus 9 tons, or about 6 milligrams of helium-3. Clearly, the total amount of helium-3 on Earth greatly exceeds the total amount of helium-3 in the samples that the astronauts supposedly retrieved. And just where is this helium-3 anyway? Is it sitting in a gas cylinder in some warehouse somewhere, ready to use? Or is it still buried in the Earth's mantle? All the helium-3 in the world isn't going to do anyone any good if it's stuck in a rock that's buried under the Earth's crust, or at the bottom of the ocean. Have you never heard of excavation? How else do you think we know that there is any helium-3 on Earth to begin with?